electricity waves in non-emission potential. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello again, and uh, thanks to Joshua especially and the other organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about waves featuring a constant intensity uh, exploiting the non-hermeticity of systems with loss and gain. And before I start with the actual physics, yes, uh, I would like to introduce the people with whom I have been working on this project. So there is uh, Kostas Makris, a diploma student of us, Andri Brandstetter, and my PhD advisor, Stefan Rotter. And on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, there's Demetrios Christodolides and Siad Muslimani from the University of Central Florida and the Florida State University, respectively. Okay, as we all know, uh, one of the fundamental properties of a wave is interference, meaning the superposition of many or just a few partial waves. And if we look at this pretty simple system, so hard wall boundary conditions, circular, uh, and just uh, two-dimensional, if we excite um, a very, so if we apply a very simple excitation, just excite one spot, uh, this is what happens if we uh, let it evolve in time. As you can see, there are fringes emerging, uh, emerging and the intensity is a complex function of the spatial coordinates and time. But also for <coughs> time-independent systems, so just injecting a single wavelength into the system, you see that immediately if uh, the wave hits some kind of obstacle, um, the intensity uh, that was originally a plane wave, so constant, is not constant anymore. Okay, so now we look at a specific wave equation, so for example this Schrödinger-like paraxial approximation. Uh, we know that the most simple and probably the most fundamental solution is just a plane wave in case of a uniform potential, a, homo a homogeneous potential, and this plane wave features a constant intensity throughout the whole space. Uh, but again, uh, as I said, once uh, the wave hits an obstacle, this property is destroyed immediately. However, for non-emission potentials, there has been a lot of work, uh, and many people uh, have been involved uh, in attempts to, uh, to hide a scattering potential, let's say, at least in the asymptotic regions, and uh, there was a very nice idea where already quite a few people uh, worked on this, which was termed unidirectional invisibility, because uh, for such a system it was shown uh, that if you, inject it, if you inject the wave from one side, uh, the wave looks like as if the scattering potential wasn't there at all on the other side, and if you inject it uh, from, the from the other direction, uh, it doesn't work, so that's the reason why this was called unidirectional invisibility. And in the meantime, it was also confirmed in the experiment. And starting from these ideas for non-Hermitian potentials, we asked ourselves the question, is it actually also possible uh, to get the intensity inside the scattering region uh, homogeneous as well? And of course, the answer is yes, as you may have already anticipated. So again, we're looking at the Schrödinger-like equation, and we studied this type of potentials with some generating function W. And uh, those constant intensity waves uh, exist as a solution of this equation, uh, and they, they look like this. So uh, the exponent might be a very complicated function of the spatial coordinates, but you easy, easily see that the intensity is constant throughout the whole space, although the potential uh, is not homogeneous. And this works for very general uh, functions w in the potential here. So in this way we introduce a whole class of systems that allow for such a constant intensity solution. And I hope you will believe me that in case of an even function uh, w, the effective potential is pt symmetric, so there is also some, some overlap of our general findings with the whole pt business in this sense. Okay, so now for some first results already. Um, as I told you, our 
constant intensity waves are constant throughout the whole space, just like a plane wave. So this would mean that, uh, in theory, they carry an infinite amount of energy, which is, uh, let's say, a little hard to implement in the experiment, so ultimately you will have to truncate your wave by some finite aperture. And we looked at this potential. So we looked at the waveguide system with a 1D cross-section in the first step, so X is the transverse coordinate, and the propagation direction will be C. And this is the potential we used, so the real part, uh, the green curve is the real part, and the imaginary part is the blue and, uh, and red regions, uh, which depict uh, lossy and gainy regions, respectively. So, and what you see here, we choose an aperture uh, that is located between minus 50 and plus 50, and we injected a wave into the system, into the system that is a plane wave, but does not feature uh, the the proper phase factor we would require for a constant intensity solution. And this very small structure here is actually the potential. And you see what immediately happens: the uh, the constant intensity wave front is immediately amplified uh, in the gain regions and damped in the lossy regions. Uh, However, if we inject a truncated version of this constant intensity wave, uh, we see that the intensity, so that's this plateau here inside uh, the aperture, is, uh, is constant over a considerable length uh, in C direction. So please also note the different scaling. So here it ranges from 0 to 5, and here uh, the plateau of constant intensity is exactly at 1. And if we increase, the size of the aperture, we can also increase uh, the length over which the wave maintains its property of a constant intensity. Okay, so that, that was for such a wave guide system with a 1D cross-section. So what about 2D cross-sections? Um, uh, and for all the generalizations of our CI concepts, I will start from these equations. So from the, from the wave equation, the effective potential, and the constant wave constant intensity wave solution. So for the, uh, for the potential, of course, this uh, second order derivative just turns into a 2D Laplacian. Also the potential can be generalized, so this function uh, W is now a real valued two component vector field with this property. And also the constant intensity solution exists again and uh, the simplified notation I'm using here means that we start, so this is a, uh, a contour integration, a curve integration, where we start from an arbitrary point uh, and we end up in the point x, y uh, we are interested in. And we applied these 2D concepts to this system, so it's just a periodic lattice uh, of gain and loss regions uh, that obeys uh, these this rules we found for the for the potential, and this is the intensity plot. So the propagation direction is now upwards, and we again truncated our solution uh, with an aperture that is circular now in that case. And the red rod you are seeing, uh, so to speak, is a surface of constant intensity of the wave. And you can also see it uh, at those smaller insets, uh, which just show the intensity at specific C planes. Uh, so this dark red uh, circle here is, uh, is the region we are interested in. And again, as in the 1D case, uh, it maintains the property of a constant intensity over a considerable length. Okay, so we just saw that these concepts work for, for 1D and 2D cross-sections, which is already quite nice in my opinion, of course. Uh, but what about nonlinear wave equations? So, so we moved on to a nonlinear wave equation by just uh, inserting such a care type uh, nonlinearity with the nonlinearity non parameter G. Uh, okay, and we found that these solutions all also exist for nonlinear wave equations, and even more surprising the effective potential is completely the same as in the linear case. 
So that's, that's actually some kind of confirmation bias I'm inducing here, uh, showing you the exact same, same thing twice to <laughs> convince you that it's, uh, that it's the same. Uh, but you can believe me, it is. It is so, and also the, uh, the constant intensity solution is only modified by an additional factor in the phase that depends linear on the nonlinearity parameter g and quadratically on the amplitude of the wave. So um, I have to admit I'm not really a nonlinearity guy, so I never dealt with nonlinear equations, but, uh, but this is uh, what nonlinear specialists told me what you would just expect for such a nonlinear non uh, equation. And as a nice spin-off, uh, so to speak, of our findings for the nonlinear case. Could you show the, the so uh, the amplitude, which uh, appears in short, and the, uh, square the exponent is multiplying time. That is like time, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's like the KDD kind of waves, where uh, mm -hmm. the amplitude of the wave is the square root of the velocity. Mm -hmm. I guess so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, but soliton solutions are not really constant intensity, but yeah, it's, it's more or less an ordinary nonlinear equation. Uh, okay, so now, thanks. <laughs> so now, uh, as a spin off uh, of this nonlinear findings we got, uh, is that we realized that our constant intensity waves <coughs> open up for the first time the possibility to study uh, the so called modulation instability for non-homogeneous systems. And again I was told uh, by non-linear guys that this is just what you would expect. So what is done there is uh, you inject a constant intensity wave into your system and then you, uh, and then you add some noise and you watch what, the pert what's the, what this perturbation does if you uh, yes, go on in time or in this case the C direction. And they told me that this is pretty much expected uh, for the self-focusing case corresponding to a positive value of G. Uh, there is a so-called filament structure, emer structure emerging. And also in the defocusing case, there's some structure emerging. But again, as you would expect, uh, the amplitude of this perturbation is much smaller than in the self-focusing case. Okay, so... Uh, this one? Yeah. Yes. It is. Okay. Yes. One more question. If the nonlinearity was general, not just Q, but higher number, uh -huh. would you still have the same VX here? Mm, honestly, I'm not sure. So we studied only this quadratic nonlinear equations. But that's, that's a good point we can look at, yeah? Thanks. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's a nice thing, thanks. Uh, okay, so, so that's for the, the nonlinear stuff. Now I'm returning to, uh, to a linear wave equation. And what I told you so far is uh, for waveguide systems, so the potential is not varied along the, the direction of propagation, which is C in my case here. So now I'm switching to scattering systems, meaning systems where the potential is also varied along the propagation direction, so there is uh, things like a finite reflectivity and so on come into the game, and for that reason uh, I'm switching over from this Schrödinger-like equation uh, to just the Helmholtz equation. And as you of course know is that if I want to solve these equations, I have to impose certain boundary condi uh, conditions at the boundaries of my scattering region. And since such a constant intensity solution would feature a perfect transmission, of course, uh, it turned out that the proper boundary conditions are, of course, those of perfect transmission. So there's only a purely incoming wave on the other side and purely outgoing uh, on the one side. And, hmm, and such boundary conditions were actually studied uh, from our colleagues in Prague. Uh, in a different context. Okay, so the role of my effective potential here is now played by uh, 
by the dielectric constant. So what expression do we get for the dielectric constant that would allow uh, CI waves? Surprisingly, again, uh, the structure is very, very similar to the waveguide system. There's just an extra factor of K appearing here. And also, uh, the constant intensity solution does not only exist, also for this case, but again, it is very, very similar to what we had before, just again, another factor of K. Okay, and we tested these concepts in a system like this. So the injection happens from the left, just the 1D system, and the gray, uh, the gray regions, the gray region actually, uh, depicts the real part of the refractive index. So just this system consisting of several spikes, and you see uh, what happens if you inject the wave, a finite part is uh, reflected. You can tell it's tell it is from the fringes that emerge. And inside the scattering region, uh, for this real refractive index, there are some complex interference patterns emerging. But again, if we, if we add the proper loss and gain, so depicted now by red and green respectively, uh, we get a perfectly constant transmission through the system. So and there are actually two ways uh, of applying our ideas. So the first is what I did in the results I showed you this far, um, is that I assumed that the generating function I would need for the potential uh, is already known. So the complex potential I would need for CI is then easily calculated, of course. But um, another way is actually uh, the more realistic one, is that I start from a known distribution for the real part of the refractive index. And I, I raised the question, is it actually possible uh, to calculate the proper loss and gain for a known real part uh, to get CI solutions again? And we solve this problem by a simple iterative scheme, starting from the real part uh, and getting the imaginary part. And we tried our concepts in one of the most challenging systems, namely a localized one. So there you can see the very, uh, very complex real part of the refractive index. And if we don't add the proper loss and gain, you see this is what happens. So the wave is localized uh, near the input and cannot uh, traverse the system. And now Michi-san yesterday uh, actually told us a little bit about localization. So what happens there is uh, that the wave is exponentially uh, decreasing uh, corresponding to the so-called localization length psi. But again, if we add the proper uh, loss and gain to the system, even for such a completely localizing system, uh, we get constant intensity again. And we even tried it uh, not only with, so I don't have it in my slides, but but we tried it not only for the real part of, uh, of the refractive index, but for the real part plus only the gain regions. And even then, uh, you're, still, you're still localized, and only if you also add the losses, uh, you find constant intensity again. Uh, no, actually, so in this case, we somehow <laughs> violate a little bit Kram's chronic relations, we assume that the real part is not affected by the imaginary part. But, yeah, it should, it should work in <laughs> the experiment. We suggest. Yeah? Is this a question or a comment? Yes, that's true, but we assume that the, that the mistake, the error we have, should be small yes, in that case. Could you, not, could you not get the imaginary part simply as a derivative of the square root of the real part? In that case, you get the quadratic potential. No, and the reason is, I think, because in the Helmholtz equation, the refractive index appears quadratically. So it's not that easy. The refractive index appears? Quadratically. Not to the first order. So it's, uh, as I said, the, the iterative scheme we used is, is, is pretty simple. But uh, yes, you would have to solve uh, 
an effective equation in. So the potential is not at the back, the potential is not. Sorry? The potential is not the potential is not. Uh, what potential, sorry? What uh, potential? Ah, okay, so that's the name, okay, so I even don't know the name. Uh, yeah, so, no. Um, it, is, it is a potential of that kind. So the dielectric, func dielectric function, which is the square of the reflective index, of course, obeys this relation. So and we use this, this relation, of course, to, to calculate the proper imaginary part, yeah, starting from a real part. Okay. Okay, now to my last uh, generalization of those findings. Uh, experimentalists, we already talked about our stuff said, well, you know, such a, such a continuous spatially dependent refractive index will be very hard to implement in an experiment. What about discrete systems? So you can think about uh, coupled single mode waveguides, for example, or coupled microwave resonators or what else. Um, so uh, again, I'm switching over from the Schrödinger-like equation to the Helmholtz equation, but now just the second order derivative in its finite differences version. Uh, and it's very similar for the dielectric constant. So this, this derivative again uh, is replaced by the finite differences expression. And also the constant intensity waves uh, exist again, and they are more or less straightforward. Uh, translated to discrete systems, so the integral appearing here just becomes a sum. And of course we tried uh, these findings also numerically for these two systems, so red, the red uh, <coughs> curves are the degenerating function W, and you can see again the real part, the blue curves of, uh, of, the, of the refractive index, and the imaginary part is the green curve, and again the so to speak, the most boring curves in these plots are actually the, the physically most inter interesting ones, which are the perfectly flat, homogeneous uh, intensity curves for the wave. Again, okay, so this already leads me to a short summary. What I've told you, in the yes, at least approximately 25 minutes. Um, for Hermitian systems, it is not possible to get constant intensity waves uh, unless you have a homogeneous potential. But this restriction to homogeneous potentials is conveniently lifted for non-uniform potentials <coughs> of this certain class we studied. But uh, these concepts are very versatile. So for waveguide systems, they work for a 1D cross-section, a 2D cross-section. It works for non-linear wave equations. And it works for scattering systems either continuous or discrete. And actually this, uh, this class of potentials we studied is not really a restriction because for a given Hermitian potential uh, you can find the proper loss and gain by this iterative scheme <coughs> uh, more or less easily. And uh, another point that we consider important is that the experimental op uh, implementation of our findings should be within reach. So for example, if you think uh, of a laser system that is optically pumped, uh, you can get a spatially dependent uh, imaginary part of the refractive index there by not uniformly pumping the system, but by using uh, a, spatial a spatial light modulator. So, and uh, what can these concepts of constant intensity be used for? Well, I already told you that this opens up a whole new area for for studying the modulation instability for non-homogeneous potentials. Mm -hmm. And of course, there should be uh, some relation to the cloaking business. And uh, we are not really sure whether this class of potentials we studied is actually the only one allowing for constant intensity. So there might be other classes allowing such solutions. And of course, there might be other applications uh, we didn't even think of. So we would be very happy if you could come up uh, with some ideas and everything, uh, almost everything I told you can be found in this paper except uh, the scattering stuff but we are already 
we already have a manuscript in the pipe, so it should be it should appear pretty soon somewhere. And that's it for constant intensity. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just switching okay. over to that. Oops. Um, I don't know, but, but I think it will be easier to follow yeah, for the other ones. If it eventually appears. Yeah. Okay, so now no, let's try it. No, okay. So uh, yes. Yeah, what you can do, you can take exactly this potential, but in the equation it will be multiplied not by psi, but rather by absolute squared absolute value of psi and psi. So it will be what is called the mm -hmm. nonlinear potential. Then, of course, okay. The constant intensity solution will remain essentially the same up to the trivial changes in notation. However, things like the modulational stability and maybe when you consider the truncated version with the scattering and other things will become completely different. Mm -hmm. So, okay. first of all, the modulational stability will become completely different. Also, formally, the solution will remain essentially the same. Okay, thanks. This point. Mm -hmm. But uh, the result is chakra. Sorry? So in other words, this could be a purely lossy potential as well. Uh, no, as it turns out. Um, mm, I think, so uh, honestly, I don't know it by heart, but there is some. Mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, so that, that's why I wrote it works for general W, but not for really arbitrary W. So there is some. Uh, I think the imaginary part, if you do the math, uh, you see that it has to be zero somewhere, so there. I think there's all that's. Uh, you would al al always have the combination of lossy and gainy regions, but that's actually another another good point I didn't mention in my talk. So um, we think that maybe in a first experimental realization, one could show for a purely lossy system, which would probably be easier than uh, than a system with loss and gain. Uh, there might be experiments in the spirit of those very early PT experiments with, uh, with pu purely loss. And we think our solutions there will then just decay exponentially and would have no, no other fringes in a purely lossy system. Just shifting the imaginary part. Actually, I think we have, <laughs> but, uh, but there are still some open questions. So we also looked uh, at the flux because, as it turns out, the flux in the system is then just given uh, by this function w. And I think this might be a physical region where you, uh, reason why you will need uh, loss and gain regions because if you have some, um, some, some net flux for the whole system that is not just from left to the right, uh, you won't have a constant density. Yes, yeah. but for a for a mission yeah. system, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to play with. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. But but this, but there's the restriction to homogeneous potentials, and we and we lift it for for non hermitian system. Yeah.
question, why does it have to have, wh why does it have to be a region of loss and a region of gain? So the, the potential W has to be localized. So it has to grow and then decay. That means the derivative of that has to change sign. The derivative has to change sign. That means there's a gain and there's a loss. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can't have just gain because then your potential will have to be growing. It will yeah. not be localized. You mean for 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 a pulse? Uh, oh, for depending on what you want to close, but you only have constant intensity, right? When you send something to your design potential, and the question mm -hmm. is, can you also compensate for the phase to basically know it? So, so would it be practical? Uh, yes, that's a very good hint. I think we didn't study this. Uh, you mean if I can also cloak it in terms of time delay, right? The phase okay. derivative and so. The yes. That's 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 true. That's true. But we didn't so far explicitly look at this. But we will do. So that's al already on our schedule. I'm not sure whether you can just you can just multiply the imaginary part by some constant. Uh, I think the also the absolute value of gain and loss sh should be fixed for a given uh, for a given real part of the refractive index. So in the end, because in the end you must obey, uh, you must get a potential of this kind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. I never <laughs> dealt with supersymmetry. <laughs> okay. but, but there might be some, some nice connection. And if, if you could, could come up pointing it out, we would be very grateful. Yeah? For the scattering systems, it's not true. So, yes, but but at the uh, at some later stage, I also talk about scattering systems, where the index is varied along the. System? Let's say the one dimensional or the two dimensional. You had the, a homogeneous equation. There was no eigenvalue, so to speak. There was no omega dependent term. So it's like the lowest mode. Surely you um, have higher modes. Would, would well, it's not actually. If you mean by lowest mode, the lowest confined mode in some kind of wave structure, yeah, that's so not true because since it has uh, so the constant intensity, it's a radiation mode. So, uh, so all modes will be uh, continuous. Uh, 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 no, I guess no. It's just just one specific just solution that that we just consider. Okay, and, and, and as for my, my remark earlier about the Kramer's chronic relations, I am sure that if you took the ep the epsilon which was of this form, uh, the epsilon which was of this form, if you transform it to Fourier space, so you have a, a convolution mm -hmm. of the two Fourier transforms of W, and then relate the imaginary part and the real part of the Fourier transform. Uh, forms of epsilon, they should uh, satisfy the common relation, otherwise, mm -hmm. what you're doing. Okay. 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 So, thank you. Thank you for a very, very nice talk. <laughs> and, uh,